Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at building your team. Don't be a generalist, be an expert. Hire the best people you can to help you fix the hard problems. We're going to look at choosing the right accountant, the right lawyers, the right money coach. Most importantly, how to bring it all together to get you the right outcome for the right fee to give you the right level of peace of mind. As always, take plenty of notes, but always take plenty of action. See you on the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Renshaw. Mr. Baxter, thank you for having me. Where are we, by the way? This looks like a brand new studio for us. Brand new studio. The powers that be got the wallet out, and I think they've done a pretty good job, to be perfectly honest. Indeed, they have, and we've got the old bull looking over us here, the bull market, symbolic of, so Just great to be memory at the moment, but yes. I know, right? <laughs> it's been tough. In any case, we've got a great topic, as we've used our team to be able to develop our studio. We're going to be talking about building out your team. Very, very important for any success or wealth creation. Absolutely. I think, you know, the old adage, if you're the smartest person in the room, you've got a real problem. And, you know, people place an awful lot of pressure on themselves to try and learn as much as you can. And look, I'm a huge advocate for financial literacy. Uh, but at the same time, you can't be an expert at everything. And I think enlisting the help of people that are recognized experts in their chosen field adds considerable value when you've got the right partner there. It takes an awful lot of pressure off you and you become the conductor of the orchestra rather than the person playing the instrument. And I guess this episode, AB, are we we bespoke to business owners out there and entrepreneurs or does this range a little bit deeper than that? I think this is particularly orientated around the world of investing uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, And and there are key components that you do need into your team. You know, oftentimes when we talk about investing, people just think it's the actual underlying asset and the performance of that. But there's so much around that in terms of tax and structuring, uh, particularly. And I think having a team of experts around you to ensure that uh, where you end up on your investing journey is where you expect to be, as opposed to finding yourself really in a a, a fairly difficult situation where your structuring is all wrong or you've incurred a a really substantial tax bill, which could have been uh, avoided by some better planning earlier on in the process. Well, speaking of which, let's dive into that right now. Mm. What kind of advisors would you be looking at? Well, you know, my old mate Robert Kiyosaki, one of my very early mentors and someone I've had the privilege of traveling around the world speaking alongside for for nearly two decades now. Um, He's built his rich rich dad team, as he calls them. uh, And it's a really interesting model where he has his CPA in the US and, and various other structural advisors. And I think as good a model as you can have, that's probably a good place to start. So... Tintax, first thing you need to have is a good accountant. And it's very, very easy to say good accountant. Finding a good accountant can be a little bit more challenging. How do you actually find a good accountant? That may sound like a fairly open-ended question. Mm. It's not not easy. I think finding anybody that's good at what they do um, is quite challenging. Anyone's website or or, or whatever it may be, uh, socials can look quite alluring. Uh, but it's whether they've got the ability to deliver. So I always like the idea of referrals in the first instance. Um, You know, if you've got someone that you trust that's maybe playing at the same level you are or on the same sort of pathway and they've been able to identify someone and they've got demonstrable results from it, then then certainly um, that can be that can be a great way to get in. Yeah, you know, my first uh, accountant was a referral from a family friend. Um, you know, I've had, I, I used to have a policy of rotating my accountant probably about every four years. And we'll talk about, you know, advisor fatigue uh, as, as we move through the, uh, the, 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 the podcast. Um, and I had one really brilliant accountant, a bit too good to be honest, and found himself in trouble uh, with some of the advice that he was providing. Um, I've had some absolute rotten, useless uh, accountants that add no value. They're just simply bean collectors for the ATO where they just you know, add no value to your tax return. Uh, I've used big firms. I've used you know, sole uh, practitioners and just about everything in between. And I think you know, sometimes it comes down to relationship uh, and, and the connect with that person. And you, know, you don't necessarily appoint the first accountant you meet. It's good to interview so that you can work on, for example, what their fee structure may look like, what their area of expertise is. So I've got an accountant in the US, for example, uh, and he very, very specifically focuses on online startups, which is perfect for one of the businesses that we run there, that's his niche. So you're dealing with someone that's got the game plan for that very, very specific area. Uh, And I do try and avoid generalists. You know, when you've got an accountant, I can do everything. Um, You might be able to do everything, but can you do it well? Uh, so it's good to find, uh, you know, um, people that have got certain areas of expertise that's relevant to you. And let's face it, when you're starting out, you know, it's going to be a fairly basic requirement. Um, if you're an individual, it's going to be your tax return. Uh, one of the things that we encourage, of course, is structuring. And we'll get onto a little how you do that as we go through. Um, 
And so having someone that can assist in that structuring to make sure that if you set up as a company or as a trust or if it's super that uh, they're able to handle that particular uh, uh, avenue and, and, and add value within that for you. But that sort of comes with time. Just getting started is the key thing. Um, and, and, and having someone that's going to be fighting for you as if it's their tax dollar uh, that they're helping, uh, helping you manage so you don't pay unnecessary amounts of tax. There's nothing worse than doing your own tax return either, I can imagine. Oh, you think you're being smart. It's in an Excel spreadsheet, you're saving some money, but the reality is uh, now there are going to be gaping holes in what you do. You may miss lodgement dates, incur penalties, all of those sorts of things. I think a really good question to sit down with, and they hate providing it, but it's a really good opening salvo, is to say, look, once, once we're done with the meeting, can you email me through a list of every relevant tax deduction that you can think of for me? And that puts wow. the onus on them straight away that it's like, hey, you know, I'm not just going to accept what you say. I want you to think about this. This is uh, serious. You know, and so, for example, you know, you might have a dog that you claim as security. Wouldn't recommend doing that. But you know, if you're a tradie and you've got a yard full of tools, um, you know, having a Rottweiler running around is probably not a bad idea from a security perspective. And it may well, yeah, you know, I'm not giving you tax advice, but that's an example of something that if you've got a an entrepreneurial accountant that's across what can be and what can't be claimed, that's something, for example, that might sit within the, the auspices of a claim for you. There you go. That's an interesting one. Okay, so number one, accountant in terms of the, the finances and the money, AB, what yeah. about the lawyer? Lawyer is really important too. Uh, again, lawyers come in all shapes and sizes. And again, I've had a broad range of experience with, with different uh, lawyers over time. Uh, and again, it, this may seem premature and oftentimes people only think, oh, I need a lawyer if I'm in trouble. But in actual fact, having a good quality lawyer on the team uh, is extremely important in whatever your endeavor may be. So, you know, if you're someone that's fairly active in the property space, having someone that's good at convincing, everyone does convincing, but are they good at it? You know, it's low fee. Uh, transactional kind of relationship at that level. Uh, but nonetheless, it's important. And, you know, I've got a, a really good convincing specialist that we've used and uh, on a particular property transaction a couple of years ago now, um, there was a clause in the contract, I was a seller, and and the buyer came back, there'd been some storm damage uh, uh, of the property uh, during the settlement process. It was actually after the property went unconditional. Uh, and their side kicked up and said, look, you're gonna have to make all this stuff good, uh, otherwise we won't settle. Uh, and you think, well, I want a settlement, I'm gonna do the right thing and help you out. And they got quite narky about it. And I've got, a, as I say, I've got a fantastic convincing specialist. And they said, have you seen clause H in the contract? Brought up clause H, had a look, and it's their responsibility you know, to provide insurance. Um, once the contract becomes unconditional, so any damage thereafter is their issue. And that would have saved me, you know, best part of probably 50, 60 grand. So that's an example of having someone in the team send them a very nice bottle of wine, I can tell you. Yeah, and you think about convincing is not a high high cost thing, you know, maybe a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks perhaps for a, a normal property transaction. Yet the value added was was excellent on the basis of them being very good at what they do. Um, equally, you know, people that are across, you know, structuring advice or your uh, your estate planning, for example, making sure your will is up to date and that they continue to, I'm not going to say harass you, but have a maintenance relationship where you don't call them to say, hey, um, yeah, I've done my will for the last 15 years, probably a good time for a chat. Maybe every couple of years they're calling to say, hey, um, How's everything? Has there been any material change in your circumstances? Which, given you know the number of children my wife and I have, you know, we went through a patch where you know there were, there were constantly new additions to our family, <laughs> uh, and having your affairs kept up to date like that is extremely important. And a good proactive team member uh, does that for you. So you know, there's an example uh, again at, at, at the more basic level. Uh, equally, as you move further along the line, as I say, the relationships grow over time. Uh, you may not just need someone that does basic convincing. You might be looking to do a development, in which case you need someone that specialises in planning uh, and is able to then put you in touch with their network of people, uh, from surveying through to uh, people to um, you know help you with your development application and whatever it may be. So if you then move into a development space, you need a lawyer that specialises in that, and it may be that old faith does all of those things, but chances are they don't, and they oftentimes will refer you out to people that are that are experts in the equally tax law. I'll probably um, have one of the single best tax lawyers in Australia, bar none, um, in the team for a very good reason. They're worth their weight in gold. And these these kinds of things can be expensive. These advisors can be expensive, albeit as long as they're providing value too, it's well worth it, right? Hundred percent. The the value of any advisor needs to be absolute. So you pay a fee, and oftentimes that fee uh, can be quite expensive, particularly for for what you might expect to be good advice. But the potential yield on that fee that you're paying 
is exponential. So if I go back to the tax lawyer and he does charge like a wounded bull, and the yeah, um, and yet the return on that spend is easily 10x. So well worth it. It's like an investment well worth it. in your team. Well worth it. So you know, you oftentimes and tax is a very good example of that, um, where you may feel, um, and we'll get on to you know doing the right thing versus you know trying to trying to step inside the law. Um, the tax office, or, or, or when it comes to having issues with the tax office, can be very very intimidating. And when you've got somebody in your team to say it's okay, I've got this, and it's not their first rodeo, and they walk you through this is the game plan and this is where it's at. And you can just feel that sigh of relief and weight lifted off your shoulders because of it. And I can say this firsthand, where you know you're faced with a fairly substantial challenge, but by putting the right person into bat to deal with it, there is no challenge because okay, I can see your position on this, and we're quite happy with that. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference in outcome. Well, I might need to get him in touch or or her mm. in touch. Yeah, and 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 that's the key thing: having someone that's an expert in the field. And this is this is. Crucial. Speaking of yield and money, AB, mm. the last one we spoke of when we kicked the can around earlier on was having the money coach, yep. which is equally as important as, as the other two. So talk to us about what that might look like. Yeah, look, a money advisor or money coach or mentor uh, can take on, I guess, a lot of dimensions. And, and traditionally in that slot, um, you'd have people would traditionally have a financial advisor or financial planner, or perhaps they have a stockbroker. Um, I think those roles are actually quite narrow uh, and whilst they can be important parts of the business, and look, I own a stockbroking firm, I own a financial planning business, they're both very important uh, roles in their own right, but they're not the same role. Uh, and I think, again, you know, having a generalist that covers both is not so good if you're involved with the stock market. Have someone that's across the market, not just the Aussie, but you know, the US or international markets, if that be the case. And likewise, on the financial planning side, and we'll talk some of the things to avoid later on, but some, typically financial planners are involved with more personalized advice, in which case they're across you know, a whole group of assets, insurance, uh, particularly could be managed investments. It could be a, a raft of other things in that space but they're not necessarily involved with day-to-day -day moves in what BHP or Commonwealth Bank did today. So I think they're two separate roles. And I think having ultimately uh, a money coach, which is, I guess, to an extent where people in our business, in our, in our major business sit, it can direct clients down the right pathway to ask the right questions of those people, uh, rather than just trying to wrap it all up in one kind of role. Uh, and again, having a money coach is someone that can sit back and look at a more holistic perspective rather than just the singular of that particular um, either investment or investment asset class. And I guess look, just to, 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 to move forward on this AB, this sounds quite complicated, I'm assuming for a lot of our listeners out there. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily need no. to be because you can start basic with these yes. and then move into more complex type setups mm -hmm. with these advisors. Talk to us what that might look like. 100%. First of all, I'd, I'd interview for those roles. Um, and, and look, you're not going to get a partner from a big accounting practice, come down and have a chat over a coffee. Um, I think going very open, I'm all about openness and communication. Um, you've gone through the work where you've set yourself a goal, you've got yourself a game plan in play. And I think yeah, putting the call in to say, look, I'm a prospective new client, I'd like to come in and have a chat before I commit to starting the relationship. You sit down and you prepare, you go and say, hey, look, these are what my goals and objectives are. This is the plan I've put together. I know I'm going to need some help down the line. I'm currently interviewing um, to, to, to put my team together. Can you tell me about the experience that you've had with this? Would you be able to help me? And, and it's such a left of center conversation for most professional advisors because oftentimes those, and we've had plenty of them in our boardroom where people come in for a one-on-one -on -one or a conversation about what they want to do. And it's almost a one-way conversation with the advisors going, we do this, we do that, we can do this, we can do that, instead of sitting back saying, okay, what do you, what are you looking for? When somebody actually comes in and says, I'm looking for this, how can you help me? It's a much easier meeting in the first instance because they're prepared, they possibly know what they need, maybe they don't, but they possibly do. And um, they're a pleasure to work with because you're dealing with someone that's organized and they're always the easiest clients uh, just just from you know being in the space that we are just from that observation so getting started you know find your accountant first of all because you're going to have an annual tax issue that you need to make sure that you sort it out you're claiming everything you can claim um, and and then lay out what your game plan might be going forward say look i'm planning on you know i'd like to buy an investment property by the end of next year do you do conveyancing as well and and obviously once i've got a property i'm going to need a will uh, you probably should have a will before then, but that's a good watershed moment for a lot of people because it's the first time they have what's called a, 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 a real asset or a real 
real investment where there's some tangible value in it other than just some cash at the bank, you know, your dad goes to your next to kin. But it starts to become more complex as you add more assets in there. So there's something else to dangle the carrot for to say, look, oh, no, don't be coming in, I'll need a will. Um, and uh, and then that opens up, well, okay, well, you know, yeah, what do your memorandum of wishes look like? Oh, I want to give, you know, my daughter my watch and this over here and shout a bottle of whiskey at my wake for, you know, all that sort of detail there will start to go through, but you're building a relationship straight off the bat. It doesn't have to be scary, okay? And that's the key thing because oftentimes most people are looking to grow their business. And so you walking in the door is another qualified prospect into that business. And the fact that you're organized and you've got a level of clarity as to what you're after is the sort of clients that most professional service businesses are looking for. So if I can just ask you on that, AB, what are some of the problems that you've seen firsthand that have occurred with advisors in the past? Okay, so let's start with, let's, let's call it relationship fatigue. Um, well, for, first of all, bad advice. That's the obvious That's a given, yeah. Um, you know, if you've got someone who's given you poor quality advice, um, there are a number of um, remedial actions that are open to you depending on how bad that advice has been. You know, if they put you into investment, it didn't work, that's one thing. But if you've been you know, manifestly missold, and we saw the Royal Commission, for example, looking at particularly the banks, but the bigger dealer groups as to the mis-selling of product, things like that, um, th- there is a pathway open to you in, in that regard. Um, yeah, you know, the appropriateness of the advice that you're given. But yeah, sometimes it's just just really bad advice. Uh, and, and some of the things to avoid um, on that basis is anything that's yeah a little bit too colourful. Or let's get you set up offshore. You could be saving all this tax if you did that. Leave all that stuff. Yeah, alone. no, that's, that's just going to cause you major drama down the track, and you'll definitely need the tax lawyer to to help unpack <laughs> that particular problem. It's just simply lawyer. not worth it. So yeah, the key thing is you know stay in the tram lines. Yeah, you know, your goal should be to reduce your tax as much as is legally possible, protect your assets as much as you can, uh, and be in a position where you can capitalize on opportunities. So, um, you know, making sure the advice is good and you're not doing anything too colorful is crucial. I think secondly is something called fee creep. And again, as I mentioned, I used to rotate my accountants fairly regularly. Uh, And part of the reason for that is fee creep. Once they get a size idea of what your business is, you notice that your fees start to creep up. The uh, The service offered Typically doesn't. Uh, our current accountants have been with for for, for a, quite a substantial period of time. Great letterhead to have. And again, this becomes more important down the track um, where if it's just you and you're a sole trader and it's a small business, just getting tax done is getting your tax done. By virtue of holding a financial services license and we have a requirement to have an audit on that license every year, having a decent letterhead from your accountant that is a big firm it's a very reputable firm, not not to the point where you're just a number, but someone that really looks to service your business sits a lot better with auditors in, in, in my particular space, financial services. So that's an important consideration for me. But fee creep is a cheeky one where you just start to see that bill get bigger and bigger and there's no real discernible um, benefit from paying more. The advice hasn't improved. Um, what you're getting back hasn't changed. Invariably, the service usually slips alongside that too. Usually, yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, that leads us in then to that sort of idea of a relationship sort of slippage, if we can call it that. Uh, and probably, probably the best analogy I'd give you is if you think about how, and, and for anyone that's listening to, to, to this today, how are you dressed today to go to work? All right? And how does what you're wearing compare to what you wore for your interview? Now, I'm not suggesting today you might not be wearing a tie, maybe you did for an interview. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about making sure you present well. Or if you think about the last time you went out on a date night with your partner, what did you wear on that date night versus what did you wear on your first date? Now, the reason I use that as an example is when it was your first date, you were trying to impress and you set the standard high. When you went in for an interview, you set the standard high. Life, if you want to succeed, is all about setting high standards. And so if you're dressed today like you're going for an interview, maybe you are going for an interview, um, that shows me that you've kept your standard, your personal standards up to that nice high level, the integrity, the self-respect, the respect for the other party, whatever it might be, is all there. In a relationship with a professional advisor, normally, you know, the first meeting you sit down as you'll find out when you're interviewing, you're in the boardroom, there's a nice cup of tea or glass of water, sparkling or still, and, and they're selling their services to you. Three years down the line, you barely get a call back. And, and the service has slipped away because they've taken the relationship for granted, just like 
wearing a set of track pants to a, for, uh, to a date night with your partner. It just is an example where you don't put the respect into the relationship. And I think that's something that's important to look out for. And that's part of the reason a number of times I've changed uh, accountants and, and professional service companies because you suddenly just become a recurring revenue line for them rather than someone whose business they're trying to retain. So a common theme I'm picking up here today is finding quality advisors. Now, finding them is probably a harder task than what it sounds. So where are you actually finding these people? Mm. Is it just through referrals or are there other methods to, to, to yeah, do that? Yeah, I, I think referrals are very important um, because if someone's prepared to put a referral on something, you know, they're staking their reputation and relationship with you on it. And I don't just mean like a referral on Google or Yelp or something like that. I'm talking about someone you know. Personal referral. That tends to carry a lot more weight. Um, and I, think, I do think that's a really important thing. But there are good operators out there that you don't know about. It's a question, as I say, of interviewing. Maybe, you know, if you see companies that are hungry for business, um, you'll see their presence on social media. And it's not because they're advertising and desperate for business. They're putting their wares out there as if they were running an ad on the TV or in the newspaper. If you have blog posts where people are in the information and professional services space where there's a really good blog post on, you know, top 10 things to do before the end of the financial year to get the most benefit from your accountant. That's someone that's putting out, um, I guess, a carrot to do entice you if you're looking through cynical lenses or for giving you an alternate perspective on it, showing you what they value, how they approach it so that you can go, okay, these guys are pretty good. That's useful information. I'd like to talk to them. So it's not just, it's a gift to get effectively. So they're the sorts of things I would look for. What I'd probably look to avoid are people that are um, on the other side of it all. Uh, and again, this is probably going to ruffle a few feathers and so be it, um, is in no particular order. One of the things I'm very cautious with are financial planners that are part of a large dealer group. And that's not a criticism of that individual financial planner. And I'll be very, very specific that there are some great financial planners that are left in this industry, not many, but there are. But when you're part of a larger dealer group, your hands are somewhat tied. There's a thing called an approved product list, for example. So if you're part of, let's use the example AMP, the only products that are on the AMP approved product list are AMP products. Now, they may not be the best fit for you. And whilst there's an emphasis on the advisor providing tailored advice that's the best fit for you, it's the best fit, but it must be an AMP product. And so it might not actually. So it may, there may be something that's better out there that's outside of that suite of products. So to that end, I think sometimes dealing with a smaller shop where you've got a more tailored uh, approach to your needs in the financial planning space, at least, um, is, is, is pretty sage advice. I, I, the big dealer groups are typically, same with the banks, they're a sales funnel largely for the owner of that dealer group. Another area um, is when you have that generalist, and I, I hear this often not, I might, for example, talk to someone about trading or a trading strategy, and they'll say, I need to run that past my accountant. And then you go, okay, does your accountant have a financial services license? And odds are 99% no. of them, the answer is no. So you're dealing now with someone that's not licensed to provide you any advice on what I've just talked to you about. I'm licensed, I'm qualified, I've got all my tickets to do this. This is my lane of expertise. But you want to talk to someone that's not licensed and doesn't have my qualifications or experience or expertise in this to see what their opinion is. It doesn't quite sound right. And, and that's an easy trap for people to fall into. I need to talk to my accountant. Um, unless they're licensed, they're not going to help you on the investment side. They shouldn't be licensing, because, so they shouldn't be because they're effectively breaking the law. That said, I do involve accountants in decisions, but it needs to be in the right way, not to comment on the veracity of the strategy, to comment on the tax side of it, for example, or the structuring side, which is our expertise. I don't do my own GST return and my BAS. I don't do my annual tax return. I don't do my annual audit. I pay experts to do that. And in the same way, an accountant is an expert in doing all of those three things. They are not an expert in all things investing. It makes a lot of sense. It really does. You've got to have that specialty focus depending on what area it's in. Mm. Just as we wrap up today's episode or we come to the conclusion mm. of that, AB, what are your biggest wins that you've experienced in this space before? Look, I think the first breakthrough is realizing that you don't have to be the expert at everything. And there are professional services, good quality professional services companies out there that can really add substantial value. So that was probably the first breakthrough that is don't be overwhelmed. And for anyone listening to this, is starting this journey, um, you know, it's easy to be overwhelmed. Oh, I'm going to do all this stuff. No, you just need to find someone that can do it on a cost effective basis to give you good advice. And they're out there and you can find them. And uh, we've talked about some of the ways of, of discovering those people. So that in itself is a big breakthrough for a lot of people. It takes the shackles off and then you can slide into that role 
increasingly of being the orchestra conductor. If you don't know how to conduct the orchestra, which most people don't, get a good money coach, uh, a mentor uh, in the space that we operate that can guide you through that pathway and either make introductions to good people or help you make your own decisions on the way through by educating you. Again, very, very important part of it. Probably watching out for that fee creep and strength of relationship is another huge one. And that not being shy of sitting down and saying, look, I've just got the bill. It's more than last year and I get we've got inflation, but I haven't seen any value add for the extra money I'm paying. I'm gonna ask you to sharpen the pencil uh, and, and one of my key strategies, you can ask Jillian this because she uses it all the time, <laughs> is I've just got the bill. Um, I'll notice it's crept up. If we can do that as a uh, the, original, the the ex-GST amount, we'll pay that. So getting a 10% discount. And see what they come, come back. And invariably, yeah. So you just save yourself 10% off the bat. Yeah. It's a great life hack. You do that for everything I do. Nice. <laughs> if it's, you know, it's 10 grand plus GST, it's 11 grand. So look, we'll do 10 including GST. Uh, okay, we can do that. Yeah. And it's just asking, you know, the squeaky wheel always gets the oil in life. Absolutely. But probably on a, on a more professional note, and, and again, don't be shy of rotating. If you're not happy with the service, tell them you're not happy. Give them an opportunity to make good. And if it doesn't happen, then don't be shy about moving. And oftentimes people think, well, you know, the accountant's got me over a barrel. The financial planner's got me over a barrel. My stockbroker's got me over a barrel because they've got all my stock. When you actually move, it's actually very easy. And there are regulations within each of those industries to ensure that as a client, when you move, it's a seamless, painless process where you're not getting messed around with someone trying to, you know, leave a poison chalice for you as you go out the door. In terms of the biggest single breakthrough for me was... A little bit more recently, and, and oftentimes you'll sit and talk to your accountant, and then you're going to talk to your lawyer, and then they'll come up with an idea about something else. Put them in the same room. And the last time, my wife and I had some, some fairly complex structuring stuff that we wanted to do, and I'd had separate meetings with, with both my accountant and, and, and the particular lawyer that deals with that side of our affairs. And the accountant was giving me some good advice. The lawyer was giving me some good advice. And it was going backwards and forwards. I said, right, let's just get together. So we had a meeting in the boardroom, got it started, explained what I was looking for, said, I'm going to be back in an hour. I'm going to get a coffee. I'll let you guys work out what needs to happen. And you can let me know what we're going to do. And stepped out of the room and let them let nut them it out. Yeah. No and Chinese when, whispers in that instance. No. And when I came back in, they both sat there looking very happy. Brought them back a coffee because I'm quite benevolent. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, so what's what, what are the options that we've got? One, two, and three, what's your recommendation? And they both were on the same page and said, this is it, because we can now see from both sets of lenses, from the lawyer perspective, uh, asset protection and structuring and succession planning. On the other side of the equation was tax effectiveness and, again, asset protection to an extent um, and, and, and business efficiency were the three metrics over there. And the scribblings up on the whiteboard on there. I said, this is the game plan we're going through. Great work, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Here's your coffee. Here's your coffee. Paid the bill. And it was probably the best bill for advice I've paid for a long time because it just seamlessly worked through. Wouldn't have been cheap either, I'm assuming. It, it wasn't cheap. But again, you know, the, if you look at exponentially the amount of money uh, that's been made, saved or protected because of that, it's a no-brainer. And again, it can be quite intimidating if you're Joe Bagger Donuts, an everyday person that's new on this journey and you go into someone's office and they've got all these letters after their name and it's up in the ivory tower and it's the land of black and chrome when you walk in the boardroom and it all seems, you almost feel uncomfortable being in there. And I say this because the people listening to this podcast, they were in the same position I was when I started out and knocking on the door and going into an accountant's office is really intimidating because you know nothing and they know everything, the power balance is there. But when you realize that you're the person paying the bill and there's a master-servant relationship and you're the master and they're working for you. That's the master-servant relationship. It takes an awful lot of that pressure off. So don't be intimidated about going in there and doing this and saying, look, I think I, I kind of get what you're trying to explain. I've also got some legal advice on this as well. You know, and let's say you're looking to do a development, what structure are you going to do it in? Because depending on that could save you an enormous amount of tax, for example, equally ring fencing to make sure that if there's a problem, your asset protected on the other side of the coin is a very good example of putting those guys together. Say, let me explain what I want to seek. You guys are the experts. I'm going to sit back and listen. You tell me what I need to do. And because they're kind of on the spot and they can talk to each other on a more professional level. And again, don't be intimidated by this. If you're the, the, the client that's sitting in there, remember your person paying the bill, you're the customer at the end of the day, and you can ask as much as you want and what you might feel intimidated to ask is a silly question. That's the one you've got to ask because Just you've got ask. to feel comfortable with it. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, let them go at it. 
talk professionally, get them to explain it, then get them to explain it in plain English, then get them to put it in writing. Sign off on it, there's the advice, it's on the letterhead, and then you can move ahead. And that, as I say, on any level is, is a huge breakthrough because it can give you an awful lot of peace of mind to know that you've had good advice and you understand what that advice means. And the left and right hand are, are meeting in the middle, which are your advisors on both sides, and you can kind of almost sit back and breathe a sigh of relief that you've you know got an optimal outcome versus relaying what you think the accountant said to the lawyer that hand doesn't work. Get them in the room together, get them to nut it out and, uh, and, and, and make them earn their corn. Great advice, AB. And as, as we say for our listeners out there, start small, build up that team and over time they can start to come together and get more yep. sophisticated. Lean on a money advisor or money coach or a mentor for sure um, because, you know, Using us as an example, we've got huge experience in this space and, and, and that can shortcut, or not shortcut, that's the wrong term, fast track a, a lot of pain for you. You're not gonna cut corners, that's what shortcutting is. Fast tracking is where you cut out all the unnecessary um, learning experiences that you might have and just place you in front of the right people straight away and, and get that return on your time and investment straight away. And that's really what it boils down to. You can't be the smartest person in the room, best smartest person in the room and um, are the people that you're paying. You just Absolutely. sit back and, and heed their advice if it's good advice and you'll work that out pretty quickly and get them working for you. You're the boss. They're working for you, even though it may be intimidating, especially, as I say, if you're a knockabout person, you're new into this, these guys sometimes can um, can come across in a little bit of an arrogant and professional way. And that reframe right at the start saying, right, okay, so I appreciate the meter's running. I'm paying the bill. I'm the customer. You need to make me happy, but you need to make me understand. So keep it simple so I can understand make it as sophisticated as it needs to be, that's a win-win. And that's why having a team is far better than having an individual trying to bat it out on their own. Don't be a generalist, be an expert in your field. And that's an expert at hiring great people. Nice. And the reason we're not experts at building studios, it's why we didn't build our own. So AB, <laughs> thanks very much for having us. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.